So welcome to my project. I'm just going to show off my project before I start showing off the code. Here's the website that I've done. We have a homepage, my work, log, and about me. On the homepage, we can see this little video that explains about Open Classroom, along with the tech explaining a bit about me and some things about the project. So as you can see, we have a logo. The text changes color as we hover over it. Now let's go look at my work, which are photos that I've taken in an image sort of carousel, if you will or an image slider. So the buttons change color as we hover over them and we can navigate back and forth by clicking the buttons. Now we have a blog explaining some of the photos, which is just dummy text. It's lorem ipsum filler text. Each one has a nice outline. When we hover over the image, there's a little dotted outline that appears. Each one has its own fake blog post, again with lorem ipsum filler text. And then with the about me section, where there is a photo of me, a title, and a title, and this here is a way it explains sort of my aspirations, who I am as a person, and so on. And then we have a contact me form where you can send me an email, and this here does actually work. Oh, and also one last thing, the icon here brings us back to the home page. So we have quite a lot of components here, but we'll go through it all. So first of all, we have the index and the index is just rendering the app where I import in react and use effect. The use effect function that you see here will be seen throughout the entire project. Basically what it's used for is whenever you're at the bottom of the page and you click on another page, it just brings you back to the top of said page. Otherwise you stay at the bottom and it's rather frustrating. Here I import use effect and I had to install something called react router DOM, which is used for the navigation links inside the browser, which I'll explain. Here we have the style sheets. Here we have the different components, which are used for the navigation inside the navbar. And here we just have some blog posts, which are the posts that we see inside of yeah, the way this here works is we have a browser router, which is just a router that is mostly used with the browser. Inside this here browser router, we have the navbar, which is a component which we have here, which is this entire bar that you see at the top that includes the logo and the four links. Then under that, we have a div that includes all our routes. Each route has its own path. So if the path is just nothing, it brings us to the home, which is a default page. If the path is home, then it also brings us to the home and so on. These here have to coincide with each path that is in the navbar, but I'll show that in a second. Now, the reason why these here routes here have exact in front is because before routes also had switches. And with the switches, you're actually use an exact path, but this here isn't necessary, but it's just to show me visually that these here elements are the individual posts. You could actually remove these here exact words here and it will still work perfectly fine. So the CSS for this is rather simple. We'll just give it a background image and set to no repeat because we don't want it to repeat. Next, we have the navbar, which looks a bit complicated, but it's really not. So we are importing the React and use state. We don't need to import the use effect because we don't need to bring it back because the position is fixed. And we are also importing some icons here. What we're doing is we're declaring a, a variable, which is set to false by default with the use state. And this here has a variable called is open and its function to be able to call, to be able to change this variable is set a uh, navbar open. What we have is we have a div here, which is the header div. Inside that, the div real header. And inside that header, we have yet another div, which contains our logo. So what we're doing here is whenever we click on the logo, we set the is open to false, which it is by default. But this is so that when we click on a link, when we are in mobile view, it will just close the navigation bar and bring us to the link. Same goes with all the different links here. So we have a nav element. And in each nav element, we have a nav link, which replaces an anchor tag. And the two replaces a href. So this here would translate to a href home. In the last link here, the class name is, if this here is open, is set to true then we'll give it a class name of responsive navbar. If it's set to false, which is by default, then we give it a class name of nothing. In each individual nav link here, we have an onclick function, which set the set navbar to false. So if we click it, it'll just close the navbar, which will be on the side here. The class name, if the current page that we are on is the active page, then we'll give it a class name of active. Otherwise, we give it a class name of nothing, which nav link by default has an active page class. So if the page that you're on has this here exact path, then it will be active. So then we have a button that's invisible at this current point in time, which is to close the navigation bar. But whenever we click that, we'll get the use the set navbar bar open function and we'll get the state there it is and we'll set it to the opposite of that state so I'll give you a little demonstration here this here is this here button here it's currently set to false so whenever we click it now it's set to true and what it did is that it brought down the navigation menu, which has been moved thanks to the CSS. And now this here button is this here X button, which if we click it, it'll set it to the opposite, which is false again, which sets it as false. And the reason why this here works is because we're changing the class name based upon is open. So is open default is by false. So right now the navigation bar has no class. And as soon as we click this here, the navigation bar gets the responsive navbar class, which means that we can move this into CSS. So as you can see here, it's just a boilerplate CSS, removing all the default values for certain things. But let's go to the interest about all this here is mostly spacing and stuff. Here's where we just set the active and the hover, because if we actually are on a computer that is small enough, when you hover over it, the buttons will change color. Here, we set the actual buttons by default to invisible, and this here is set to space in between, so they're all laid out here, and they take up space of the navbar head. Then we have a media query, which says, when we are underneath this width of 1024 pixels, set the visibility of these here buttons to 100%, and change the height and width of this navbar to 100% of the height of the screen, so outside of the screen vertically. And that transition will happen in one second. The opacity will be zero, so we won't actually be able to see this. And then whenever we actually get the responsive navbar class, we'll actually move it back down by 100 viewport height. And that'll take 1.5 seconds with an ease out, and the opacity will be set to 100% again. When you're on really small screens, for example, like on the iPhone SE, it takes up 100% of the width so that the buttons are way more accessible and it's a lot cleaner. Now we have the home page, which we have an, an iFigure, which is just generated by YouTube itself whenever we hit share and embed. Then here we just have a div with loads of text, which 
is the text that we see here. The styling is rather simple, just we're putting everything into a column, so it's all stacked on top of each other, giving it specific widths, and keeping the aspect ratio of the video here, just saying all the different margins and padding, and the default font families and all sorts. And the media query here, we have it on Justify on bigger screens, and we just set it to the left on smaller screens. So moving on to My Work, and the actual component just renders the My Work template. We'll go see that right now. At first, we import React, use state, and use effect, and use state. So first of all, we do is we declare a variable of length, which takes in a custom API that I've made, and it returns its length. Custom API is this, where we import just loads of images inside the assets, and my work is just loads of photos that I have taken. And inside this, we just make an array, an image key, and an image set to one of the images. And we do that 22 times. So that returns the length. Now we do a use state, which is by default is zero, and we have the current and set current. Current is variable, set current is the function that we use to set the current variable. Now we have another function called next image. So whenever we click on the right arrow, which you can see here, on click right arrow, we check if the current is at the last index of this here array. If it is, then we set back to zero. So basically we start from the start. So this current image that you see on the screen here is zero. If we click on back, now we're at the last image, which is length minus one. Now, because we're at the last image, we click on the right, we click, and now we're at zero because it checked to see if we were at length minus one, which we were, we set it to zero, and otherwise we will just hit plus one. This here just checks if it's an array or not, if image or slider info is actually returned an array, because if it isn't, then return null, or if the length of the array for some reason is actually zero, then also return null, which means that none of this will be rendered. It's just to avoid errors. So in here, we map the image slider info with image and index as parameters to the function. So we return a div with a key of just image key, which is as seen here, image key, that is just random numbers that I wrote. The class name will be determined on the current index if the image that we are seeing is the same index as the current, and we give it a class of image and active, otherwise it's just image. After that, we check if the current index of the image is equal to the current, then we return an image with an alt of my image and the class name of image source. And also the image source will literally just be the image that we passed here. The CSS for this is rather simple. It's just so sending everything into the center and also putting everything inside like the height, taking up 100% of the view height. The actual image source, which is this here, the killer image, we give it a height of auto and all that. Just send the size that you see here. Image container, we set it to position absolute and top 50%, so the position in the middle of the screen, vertically that is. Also, here's the interesting part here. When it's an image, which means that it's not current image, the opacity is set to zero and the transition is set to two seconds. When the image is suddenly set to active, the opacity goes to 100% and the transition takes 2.5 seconds, which means that right now this here image that you see is active and is image, but the next one is just image. So when we click this here button, this here will be set to just image, but the next one will be set to active as well. So this one will fade out and the next one will fade in. There you go, just like that. And this here media query just sets it so that it changes size depending on the screen size. And also we set the arrows to the bottom instead of on the side, as you can see here, just for ease of use, and we make them slightly bigger. We have a blog, we have six blogs, which just follow the exact same structure. We import each image that we will use for the blogs, as you can see here. We use nav links to be able to click on them, as shown in the navbar. And here we have specific parameters that we have to pass in. I'm passing it into a post component, which is like a template, if you will. This is what the post looks like. We accept these here arguments, which are post image, post all, and so on, and we just render them here. Each post is just being displayed like that with each individual component a unique time, unique label, unique image, and so on. They're all like this here. The styling it gets like this here. It's just very simple. This is just to avoid any weird text when we visited the links. And the reason why it's flex wrap here, as I wrote here, is because if we were to do flex direction, there wouldn't be two images here side to side. There would just be one, which isn't great on bigger screens. Even if you zoom out a bit, you can get three, which would only be one if it was flex direction column. Here's the CSS for the post. So we just set it all into columns. So it all stacks on top of each other and meets at the sizes and the border radiuses to give them nice curved outlines with some colors and made the cursor to a pointer. Post extras just is a little text underneath. Post info is the title and the time. Post description. This here part is what I'd like to talk about is WebKit box. These here two go hand in hand, the overflow and the WebKit line. It was saying that you'll calculate this here vertically. So whenever we have three lines or more, anything past the third line will be considered as overflow. And once it goes past the three lines, we hide the element. So that, that's what these here three dots are. It does it automatically, which is really nice. And then we have a media query here, which just sets everything up so that it does actually display correctly on smaller screens. So now we have the individual blog posts, which the HTML is very simple. It's just a div containing headers and paragraphs and also the image, which is also imported as top here for each individual blog post. There's six of them, but they're all the same structure as this, so I'm just showing you one. We have the title, the author, and then inside the blog post, we set the order of the actual div. We set some padding of 10 pixels to get this in nice outline, so we set the background to the yellow color. And the object fit means that basically if the image goes past the parent, it will hide any of the image that goes past it. And then for the rest, it's really just sizing and making sure that everything is spaced out correctly and looks nice. We have a media query, which sets everything to a column, so that when we're on smaller screens, it's all stacked on top of each other. And then finally, we have the about me. Here we have to import React, use ref, and use effect. And here we use something called email.js. Now, email.js is an external service. This here, I'll skip for now, that they will be useful in just a second. Everything is wrapped in a section. So at first we have the image, which is just my photo with a header. Then we have another header, which is my name, my age, and then just loads of paragraphs. And now the interesting part is we have a form. Here we're using href. So ref refers to the form, which is at the top. So I've encased each hair into a div. This is much easier for styling. Here, the most important parts to take away is the ref and also the name. On the website, we have to create a template. Now this is a template has from email and message. This is just a boilerplate template. So you can see username, user email, and message have to coincide exactly with 
these here names because that's whatever you input in here will replace these here elements. Now that we have the use form, it's referring to this form. First of all, we have send email, which just prevents the, the whole website from refreshing once you send the email. Now we have email JS send form. So what we need is the service ID and the template ID. These here can be found on the website when we actually create them. When we add new service here, it creates a service ID. So we add that here, as you can see, they are the same. And then a template ID, as you can see here, they are the same. And then you also need your user ID. You can see here has been provided adequately. Once you have actually sent the form and you have clicked the send button, it will log these here if the log is successful, i.e. it'll log message sent successfully. And if there's an error, then it will just log an error. I didn't write most of this here code apart from obviously replacing these here things and also changing a few class names in here because email.js actually provides the code to use it inside of React. Here's the form. Here you have all the other variables and functions. The styling, just putting everything in a column. Here's all the about me stuff. Um, then again, it's just margins, patterns, and colors. Text section refers to all of these. We set the form family. This is just generated by a VS code. And now here's the interesting part is the form. So we set this form into a column for when we're not on a mobile device. Each pair is actually next to each other, as you can see. But when we actually enter the media query, we actually change the form div, which is each individual pair, display flex column as well. Each element displays on top of each other. And that basically concludes my project. I didn't go too much into detail with the CSS because again, it's mostly sizes and margins and whatnot. But yeah, that concludes my project. I hope it was satisfactory. I have tried really hard to make this. It took me a week to make, doing a bit every day as much as I could. It took a lot of research thanks to YouTube, Open Classroom, and Stack Overflow. I hope it's to your liking.